and welcome. I'm Purnima Nair and I will be talking about Maui today. Uh, it's fantastic to be presenting at the Dutch Umbraco Fest. Thank you, Leonard, and thank you ha for having me as a speaker as well. I'm a freelance.NET developer based in Berkshire, UK. Sad to be presenting virtually, but that hasn't dampened my spirits, I guess. I'm a Microsoft MVP for developer technologies, and I'm also a three-time Umbraco MVP. I started using Umbraco back when it was at its version 4.7, and Umbraco since then has always been with me. Um, Non-work me, I have a little daughter who is seven years old. I spend a lot of time with her. Currently, she is at Birmingham with her cousins <laughs> just before lockdown starts here. Um, I spend a lot of time reading, uh, mainly fiction, and I'm also a student of Carnatic music vocals. For those who don't know Carnatic music, what it is, it's a stream of Indian classical music. And that's my Twitter handle should you wish to connect with me over Twitter. So talking about Maui, um, so as I said in my introduction, it's all about the experiments that I've been doing with Maui and Umbraco. So this is a topic that really excites me. I look forward to fun topics like this when I learn things and when I present as well. So here I am. Maui stands for Multi-Platform App UI, and it's a cross-platform framework for creating native mobile and desktop apps using C Sharp and XAML. So Maui was announced at Build 2020, and I think I first read about Maui in the blog post about .NET 6 preview one earlier this year, sometime around March or April. That's when we started getting more and more Maui details, and ever since that, then the project has been growing and growing and getting stabler and um, closer or inching towards the general availability with every preview that we get. It's seen as an evolution of Xamarin forms, um, so if you are a Xamarin form, Forms developer, you, you can reuse every ounce of that knowledge that you have. If you have a Xamarin Forms app, there's a migration path available where you can port it from Xamarin Forms to .NET MAUI apps, and Microsoft has been actively promoting it as well. With MAUI, what you get is a single project that caters to all platforms, so it is write code once and run everywhere experience. That is the best phrase that can describe MAUI, I think. So it's a single project in like Xamarin Forms where you have multiple projects, one per platform, I think. Uh, but that doesn't stop you from adding any platform specific code. You, can, you have the ability to add any platform specific code if needed. You can have access to the native device capabilities. All that is possible with .NET MAUI as well. .NET MAUI is a part of the .NET unification vision. So when the unification started with .NET 5, what we had is the first deliverable of that unified vision is Blazor Wasm. And that's the same route Microsoft has taken with Xamarin. With .NET 6, all the, uh, the Xamarin capabilities have been enhanced and it's a part of .NET 6. And what we have with .NET 6 is platform specific uh, framework for creating apps. And it is with this platform specific framework that .NET MAUI interacts. So we have platform specific frameworks for Android, iOS, Mac, and Windows UI 3 as well. Currently, MAUI is in preview, preview 11, uh, and we are expecting a general availability sometime in 2022, mostly Q2, I think. Uh, but from .NET Conf 2021, which happened last month, uh, from the keynote at .NET Conf 2021, I believe that I saw the mention of some companies which are already using .NET Maui in production apps because they want to actually accelerate and take that step in the future rather than stay within the Xamarin Forms world. So that is a little intro to .NET Maui. Let's get started with .NET Maui. How can you get started as a developer? If you install Visual Studio 17.1 Preview 1, that installs all the dependencies for you to get started with .NET Maui. With .NET 6, everything is workload based in .NET 6, so you need to install the mobile development with .NET workload as well as the .NET MAUI preview, which will install all the dependencies and uh, help you get started. I started looking at .NET MAUI much before Visual Studio 2022 previews came out, and it was quite a manual effort to get it all up and running. I didn't find much success, but ever since uh, .NET MAUI got baked into Visual Studio uh, Studio 2022, the dependencies started getting available with the 
previews of Visual Studio 2022, it's been an easier path, but it is still in preview. That is one thing that we need to bear in mind. The supported platforms, Maui, iOS, Android, macOS, and Windows, and also Tizen and Linux. So it covers most of the market share out there for you. And it's a single API that you interact with, write your code once and run it everywhere. And what do we get as developers? We get a collection of cross-platform UI controls. Of course, there is a collection of controls which is suited for the XAML version of Maui. These are controls which have been built from um, scratch. But most importantly, what .NET Maui is, is a range of cross-platform APIs for accessing native device features. So .NET Maui kind of unifies all the uh, various different uh, APIs for various different platforms into a single API. So .NET Maui is actually a collection of wrapper APIs which you interact with using your code. That is what uh, caters in for the right code runs and run everywhere experience. What you can also do with this is that you have you can uh, share your UI layout and design across platforms. You can share business logic and tests and uh, .NET Maui apps compiled to native app packages as well. I haven't gone into the level of compiling and deploying it, but this is a piece of knowledge that I have from reading and researching. They compile it to native app packages. And if you are a Xamarin Forms developer, nothing is lost. You are actually gaining from it because you can port your uh, existing Xamarin Forms app into .NET Maui app, and you can reuse every ounce of your Xamarin Forms knowledge to create .NET Maui apps. In fact, there might be namespace changes, class name changes, but that can be dealt with. And as I said in my introduction, what really attracted me uh, to Maui, .NET Maui is the ability to create native mobile and desktop apps using Blazor. I am not a Xamarin Forms developer. I know nothing about Xamarin Forms, but um, .NET Maui tries to break that barrier between app and web development because I can reuse my Blazor skills to create native, uh, native apps. And that's made possible by something called Blazor Hybrid. This is what powers um, the ability to have Blazor on native mobile devices. It's an extension to Blazor. It's not a hosting model like Wasm or Server. It's actually an extension is what I understand. And it's primarily targeted at web developers who wishes to create native desktop and mobile apps with offline capabilities, making use of HTML, CSS, Razor, and of course, C Sharp. So what you can do is build native desktop and mobile apps using Blazor and Maui. And what it uses underneath the hood is something called a embedded web view control, which renders the web UI. More of that a bit later on. But if you're thinking there is a browser sandbox or there is some HTTP call that's happening underneath the hood, that's not the case. There is no browser, there's no HTTP sandbox. It's native app running on your device, be it desktop, be it mobile, Mac, uh, Android. It's native apps. What Maui Blazor bring, brings to me is the best of both worlds. For example, if I have a Blazor app, I can reuse the same code to create native apps with native device capabilities. So which means that suddenly have a broad reach going all the way from web to native devices, covering all of that platforms for me. What it also means is that I can use my web development skills to build native apps. Um, by all means, I'm always open to learning new things, but it's um, it's a totally different thing when someone says to me, hey, you have HTML and CSS skills. Now let us reuse that to build native apps. That's like blowing my mind off. So the key word when you search for Blazor and native apps is Blazor hybrid or hybrid apps using Blazor. And if you have Googled that keyword, 99.9% .9 of the time, one of the top search results that you would be getting back is mobile Blazor bindings. So when .NET Maui came out and I started um, picking up bits and bobs from here and there, I was on the absolutely wrong impression that .NET Maui Blazor app is actually powered by mobile Blazor bindings. No, these are two very different separate things. Mobile Blazor bindings to begin with is an experimental project out there. And as far as I understand, it's a collection of UI controls, uh, which are like wrappers to Xamarin Forms components. So it's more of a UI framework. 
.NET MAUI actually unifies the various platform APIs like Windows and Android and Mac OS into a single API or a collection of APIs so that your code is interacting with that wrapper APIs. So .NET MAUI is actually an API. Of course, we have the UI control, but .NET MAUI is primarily API. You write code to interact with .NET MAUI APIs um, as well as accessing the native device features if needed. So .NET MAUI is API. And the Blazor aspect of the .NET MAUI app is made possible by something called Blazor WebView. We have the Blazor hybrid, which is the extension. And underneath the hood, it uses something called Blazor WebView, which actually brings embedding of Blazor functionality into these devices. So we have WebView and uh, all of this because of the experiments that Steve Sanderson has been doing. He's the person behind Blazor. He found he had a breakthrough with WebView, and then people started writing WebView controls for various different platforms like desktop, uh, I, um, iOS devices. And suddenly there is this Blazor WebView for Maui, which enables embedding Blazor functionality. This also means that Razor component libraries, Razor components are the building blocks of any Blazor project or Blazor app. You can have Razor component libraries. You can bring that into native devices. You have Razor component libraries that can be shared between your Blazor server or WebAssembly project as well as your .MAVI apps. Underneath the hood of this Blazor WebView, this the, the driving factor is something called WebView 2, which actually uses Edge as the rendering engine to display web UI. So it's not exactly an iframe, but it's like a little window which pulls in web content from somewhere. By um, It actually pulls in what you suggest as a host page. So Edge is the rendering un, uh, engine underneath the hood, and web UI thing is like a edge capability and that's made use of in Blazor WebView and that is actually what brings Razor components into uh, WinForms as well as uh, the native devices. So if you watched Corny's talk this morning, he he kind of mentioned about WebView as well today morning. So that's a quick rundown of Maui for you. Let's see um, the solution structure in Maui. So if you are familiar with .NET 5, .NET 6, you have a same kind of path. We have a startup class, which is the .NET MAUI program class, where the Blazor WebView has been registered and that the service has been registered as well for you. And the main page of any .NET MAUI app is this main page.xaml. So things vary between the XAML version of .NET MAUI and Blazor version. So this is in the Blazor version of .NET MAUI app. And I've got the Blazor WebView control, which suggests the host page. So this is Blazor. So the, the page that gets loaded for every request to Blazor is the index.html. And that is what we have here. So as you can see, there is a div with an ID app, which is where your content gets loaded. And back to my main page, there's a root component that, being, that is being suggested to the WebView, which is a component of type main. And the selector is actually defined as well, which is the ID of that div we just saw. And if you look at this main component, which is the main.razor, it's nothing but, but your standard Blazor router. So once you have your Blazor web view in place, Blazor takes over because that is the root component. And if you look at a normal Blazor WebAssembly app or a server app, again, the root component is the router for you. So you can have this Blazor web view control everywhere um, in your app, or you can have a WinForms app or a UWP app, uh, which you can progressively then transform from being a normal UWP app to a .NET MAUI based app by ha having this web view control in place. So that is the main page. Then you have your uh, resources, which are like shared resources for um, like assets, imagery, etc. You have your platform specific code here the startup class and the configuration file for each of the platforms. So that is the .NET MAUI specific bits. Then we have the routed components um, in the pages folder. This is very similar to the Blazor WebAssembly or server project where you have the routed components. Routed components in the sense they have a route template attached to it using the page directive. And we also have the shared folder with the shared components. And uh, a quick look at the app. This is how it looks today. It's the same app, 
running as a Windows desktop app as well as a, a app on the Android um, emulator. I haven't connected my phone to um, my machine to get it running on iOS devices, but that's something for later. But I think this will do for now. Um, so going ahead, how am I using Umbraco? How am I bringing Umbraco into this mix? I'm using Umbraco as a headless CMS where I'm using Umbraco as a content store. So what I have here is a instance of Umbraco, which I've hosted on Azure. The reason being I can talk to my APIs of Umbraco because I'm using Umbraco headlessly uh, on my local machine. By all means possible, Windows works. Um, with Android, I had a little bit of a situation. Um, you can actually get it working on Android, talking to local host APIs, but I just thought, let me deploy it into Azure, and that way I can learn about deploying to Azure as well. Um, and I have my APIs working. So the data context of the day is nothing but the sessions at the Dutch Umbraco Fest. So that is a list of sessions I have got. The talks or the sessions are based on the talk document type, which has got some basic properties. Uh, apologies about the talk description. It had to be a text area. It slipped my eye. So this is the talk document type. And I also have a comment uh, document type, which is allowed as a child to comment uh, to a talk. And if I open the document up, I can see some basic information. So there's some device information being captured as well. We'll have a look at it as well. So let's first uh, talk about the first demo of the day that is reading content from Umbraco. So I'm using some concepts in Umbraco for this. So we'll talk about the Umbraco concepts and then we look at the code as well as uh, the .NET Mavi app code. So talking about Umbraco controllers, which is the first Umbraco 9 concept of the day, Umbraco API controllers are nothing but web API controllers. So if you're familiar with web API controllers in .NET, that's exactly what Umbraco API controllers are. The the difference comes in the fact that Umbraco API controllers are auto-routed, which means that you don't need to register your routes. And you start off by creating any controller and inheriting that from Umbraco API controller. There you go. You don't need to do anything else. There you have your first Umbraco API controller. Umbraco API controller inherits from the .NET controller base, which means that everything that you have access to with .NET controller base, you get the same thing in the Umbraco API controller as well. And for the routing to kick in, uh, there is a naming convention to be followed, which is all your controller classes must be suffixed with the word controller. One of the key differences between Umbraco 8 and V9 controllers is the fact that in V8, we used to have access to the services, as, as uh, I think, as well as the Umbraco helper, the Umbraco related objects. We don't have that anymore with V9. In V9, every Umbraco related object and service needs to be injected. So that's one of the key differences between V8 and V9 Umbraco API controllers for you. And by all means, if you want to make use of attribute routing in .NET, you can by all means do that. It gives you further control over the API URL. So you can forget about the auto routing part and have your own routing in place. There are three flavors of Umbraco API controllers in Umbraco. I'm using only one, which is the locally declared controllers, but nevertheless, we'll talk about the other two as well. So with locally declared controllers, the mo it is the most common way to create an Umbraco API controller. So you start off by inheriting from Umbraco API controller, and that is it sorted out for you. It's routed via the URL Umbraco slash API, followed by the controller name. So the control name is always prefixed with slash Umbraco slash API, which is the path unless and until you don't bring in attribute routing. It's not routed via an area, and there's no additional setup required. And the use case for locally declared controllers are for creating API controllers in your own projects, which is what I'm doing today. And this is how a, 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 a sample code can look like when it comes to Umbraco API controllers. And the route would be Umbraco slash API slash the name of the controller minus the word controller, followed by the action name. Second flavor of Umbraco API controllers are plugin based controllers, which inherit again from Umbraco API controllers. But unlike locally declared controllers, they are routed via an area and routed via uh, the URL, which is Umbraco slash your area name slash controller name. So basically, in plugin based controllers, 
the API segment in the route URL gets replaced by the area name, which is something that you give to the controller. And the use case is API controllers in Umbraco packages, which are meant to be distributed because plugin-based controllers are routed via an area, which means that they won't mess with any locally declared con controllers. The code is no different from Umbraco API controller or not very far off. The only extra thing that you need to add is a plugin controller attribute and give it an area name. The, the, the string that you give it as the parameter is the area name and the plugin controller attribute indicates that this is a controller that is a plugin controller and should be routed via its own area. And the route would be Umbraco slash the area name, which is my plugin area, followed by the controller name, followed by the action name. Finally, the third and final flavor of controllers, Umbraco API controllers, back office controllers, which, uh, which can be used to create API controllers to work within the back office, which means it makes use of the security model of the back office. You inherit from Umbraco authorized API controller or the Umbraco authorized JSON controller. Uh, the Umbraco authorized JSON controller actually inherits from the authorized API controller, but it supports only JSON and every request to one of the actions in the JSON controller should have the correct headers for it to work. So that's the key difference that I found. So inside your back office, if you want to create property editors um, like uh, dashboards, I think in all means you would be using the JSON controller. <clears throat> it's again auto-routed and the URL path would be umbraco slash back office slash API slash controller name, which means there's an extra segment um, over the locally declared controllers that is back office. That is what it gives it the additional security. And the use case, you can use these controllers in your own projects. If you're creating packages for back office, then you can use back office controllers as well. So that is how the controller code looks like, and that's the route. In fact, you can make it a plugin controller as well. You can give it the attribute plugin controller, especially if you want to have packages meant for back office, that would be useful. In that case, again, the APS segment gets replaced by the area name of your choice. <clears throat> concept I'm using for the day for this particular demo is Umbraco Mapper, where Umbraco Mapper is a tool available to you in Umbraco 9, which can be used to map one object to another. Um, it is not to be confused with Andy Whitland's package. We had Auto Mapper in, uh, prior to V8, I think, and with V8, it's been again, uh, Auto Mapper has been removed from the core and Umbraco Mapper has been brought in as a tool. With Umbraco Mapper, there's an interface called I Umbraco Mapper, which can be injected into your classes. And you create mapping definitions, which defines your map or how to map one, pro one object to another, what properties to map a map. And that is a class which can be created by inheriting from I map definition. And mappings finally must be registered via collection builder. So everything needs to be registered at startup. So let's have a quick look at some code and then we'll see how that is working in Maui as, as well. So I've got this talks API controller, which has got two methods, get talks and get talk. Get talks, get all the talk, and get talk gets a single talk. It's an Umbraco API controller, so I need to inject all the dependencies, which means I have the um, I Umbraco mapper as well as Umbraco helper. In my get talks method, I'm using Umbraco helper to get all the talk, uh, all the content of type talk and ordering it by the time. And then I'm using Umbraco Mapper to map the content, which is a list of, or I enumerable of talk, uh, to something called talk response. So the talk response is actually like a view model, which mimics the properties of my content node. So this calls for mapping a list of talk to a list of talk responses. So we need to look at the mapping definition for that, which is here. I've got a mapping definition deriving from my map definition, and I've got a map method which maps the properties. And finally, I have got a composer which adds my mapping definition to the collection builder. Two key differences here. Uh, sorry, one. Um, in V8, we used to achieve this using I user composer. We don't have I user composer, I think, in V9. We only have I composer. And we can also chain the mapping definitions, which is fantastic. Um, so I have another mapping definition here called comment, which I have changed, chained and added to the collection builder. 
Uh, in the get talk method, I'm doing the same thing, but instead I'm getting a single talk um, by its key and then mapping to a talk response. I'm also getting the child content that is comments um, and then adding it to my response and sending back. It's a demo, so I'm just going a bit crazy with that. Um, so that is my Umbraco API controllers. I have deployed this to Azure and it's available as an Azure um, web app service for me. And in my Maui code, I have this Umbraco integration service with two methods in it, which reaches out to my API controllers using uh, an HTTP call and deserializes it for me. And this has been registered in the startup. So which means that in my components, the Razor components, the first one being talks, I can inject the Umbraco integration service and in my own initialized async method where I can, which I can use, it's a lifecycle method in Blazor, which I can use to uh, initialize my component with data. I use the Umbraco integration service to get the talks. And uh, I'm using a bit of null check to display the information. And for each talk, what I'm also using is using the nav link component in Blazor to actually link to another component in my app so that I can display the talk details. So let's see how that looks like. That's the Android app and that's the Windows version. So if I go into the Android version, this is all loading for me. So I have all the data here. Similarly, I've got all the data here as well. So I've already deployed my app into the Android emulator, which is the way it is working now, and I'm running the Windows app. So if I go into one of the talks, let's see. I can see the details coming in. Um, and if I go into another talk here, say, again, I've got the details here. So that is the uh, reading content from Maui app. Uh, sorry, reading content from Umbraco and displaying it in the Maui app. The next demo for the day is to create content. So I want to create some content and send it back to Umbraco from Maui. Uh, this is just like a little demo. It's not something which I uh, adhere to best practice in this demo, but it's a demo, so I've just done it this way. I'm making use of content service, which is a management service to perform CRUD operations on uh, content and to publish content. As a part of content service, we get an interface called iContent service that can be injected into your classes, uh, API controllers or custom controllers. You're using service controllers the MVC way. You have the service context object, which gives you direct access to the management services as well. But in all honesty, you are probably going to use content service by injecting it into your own classes and then using from there. As a best practice, never use any management service in views. It should not be used for presenting data. It should only be used for modifying content as well as entities. Um, if you want to use um, view, if you want to present data in your views, by all means, stick to I publish content query because that is much faster and that looks up at the cache, the content cache, whereas all these management services directly interact with the database, which means that you can have noticeable performance difference. So let's see how that is done. In my Umbraco code, I again have a um, comments controller and I'm trying to add a comment. So for every talk, I can add a comment and that comment gets created as a node in Umbraco for the corresponding uh, talk content. Uh, ideally, all this code should be in a service of its own, but it's a demo, so I'm displaying like this and again, Creating content um, from an external entity. Again, it's something that's not strictly best practice. So use this wisely. I'm injecting my iContent service and Umbraco helper again because it's an Umbraco API controller and I need to inject my dependencies. And in my add comments method, I'm using the content service to create a node. Um, so my method has a comment request model which is the talk key, the title of the comment, the comment text, and something about the devices. Uh, so the device that is being used. So I'm setting the name of the node, which is the first argument as the title of my comment. And where am I creating is as a child to a content node of the key talk key. And I'm passing it the document type. It's magic string. I can use something better here. Sorry about that. 
I am setting the values for the various fields and I'm using the save and publish to save and publish the node. In reality, when you create content, uh, content, uh, content using content service, whenever I have done it, it in the past, I have always stopped with save and the publish to be a more manual process, but it's a demo. So I have just gone ahead and use save and publish. And if the result is success, I send some data back, if not a 500 error. And back in my Maui app, again, there is a method in the Umbraco integration service which reaches out using an HTTP call to my endpoint. And in my talk details, talk details component here, I have an edit form component. Edit form is a built-in component in Blazor to uh, build forms. I am passing it a model called comment request, which is very similar to what I have as the request model. And I'm saying, hey, on, on, valid, uh, on a valid submit of the form, run this event for me, or that is the event being handled. And I've got my fields here as well for the title and comment. What I'm also doing um, here is to gather some device information. So there is a namespace called microsoft.mavi.essentials, which is similar to the xamarin.essentials, where you have a lot of properties and extension methods which you can make use of. And I'm using the device info class and using the platform to actually tell me what platform uh, is the user on. Is it a UWP, that is Windows, or is it um, Android or iOS and so on? And you can actually see that in action here. It's uh, on Windows app, it's detecting UWP for me, and on Android, it's detecting Android for me. So that is uh, some information about native devices as well as uh, gathered for you there. So, and when I submit this form, I'm going to use Windows for this. Uh, so I'm going to have, hey, Connie, uh, uh, that was a fab talk. I did enjoy Connie's talk, by the way. Great talk. comments and what it does is it creates the content in Umbraco and also refreshes this little component for me. So if I go back and have a look at Kone's talk, there you go, that's my comment in place here. So that is um, that is the creating content in Umbraco from Maui app. Moving on, um, so if my entire talk was about experiments, this actually defeats, uh, defeats it all, and this is actually the cherry on top of the cake for me because I've tried to play around with real-time information. Um, and for real-time information, I'm making use of notifications in Umbraco and a service called Azure Web PubSub. So I saw this very um, exciting and fun talk by Anthony Chu at .NET Conf this year where he used a video stream from the device to create um, ASCII character, the ASCII equivalent of the video stream. It was a very fun demo which I saw and he made use of Azure Web Pops up for that. So I just wanted to try it out and so here I am. There might be other ways of doing this in Maui, but I wanted to give it a go with Azure Web Pops up. Uh, and it's a service which came into general availability around the .NET Conf time as well, if I'm not wrong. So the main Umbraco concept for the day is around notifications. So we will see how we can hook up Umbraco and use Umbraco as a publisher to send information to the Azure Web PubSub service. So notifications are basically another name for events in Umbraco V8. So they have been renamed to notifications in V9. And it's very similar to the observer pattern. So the observer pattern um, enables a subscriber to register with and receive notifications from a provider. And um, observers register with the provider and whenever a predefined condition or an action is successful, all the connected clients and all the observers are notified uh, by the provider. Typically, notifications exist in pairs, that is before and after. So if you're thinking about content and publishing of content, there would be a notification which gets initialized before the content is published and after the content is published. So the notifications are um, for that particular not, uh, for that particular action is called a content publishing notification, which happens before the content published and 
after the publish has been successful, that particular notification is called content published notification. And when and where you should be using these two, if you want the ability to cancel an action, then you need to use the before notifications. Um, there's absolutely um, genuine use cases for that. Say, for example, if say uh, some content that you've entered is not up to scratch, then you can use the before notification to say that, hey, this is wrong. Just do it. Uh, so I'm canceling this. You need to fix it before I can go ahead and say uh, publish the content. That's by all means possible. Um, use the after notifications if you want to run custom code after an action has succeeded. So if you want to say um, do something after the content has been published, use this particular notification. To create a custom notification handler, you create a class by implementing the I notification handler of type T where the T is the type of notification, and you can register the handler in the startup or as a composer. I'm so sorry about the highlight on the word composer, um, but you can register the handler in the startup or the composer. One thing to bear in mind about any notification handler is that it has a transient lifetime. So every time a notification is received, the handler gets initialized and called. So if you need persistence, make sure you put all that in a service. And talking about Azure Web PubSub, it is a service to build real-time applications using WebSockets in the publish subscribe pattern. So um, I think um, you might have watched Kony's talk this morning where he used Blaze Server in conjunction with Umbraco as a binding client. I don't have the binding client here, so I need some way of publishing from Umbraco and passing that message to my connected, my other connected client, which is my Maui app. As far as Azure Web PubSub is concerned, Umbraco as well as my Maui apps are connected clients, but I'm using Umbraco as the publisher or the, the, the entity which actually sends out the messages. And Azure Web PubSub is acting as the server which kind of sends the messages out to all the connected clients. So which means that bi-directional um, communication is possible from Maui to Umbraco as well as Umbraco to my Maui. So what you can do is publish content updates between server and connected clients. Clients do not need to poll or submit HTTP requests for updates. Um, they, they just keep on getting the messages because we have a persistent the WebSocket connection in place. If you don't want a configured backend, you can use Azure Web PubSub as a lightweight server, So which is the use case that I'm going for. There are other ways to do it. You can have, uh, I think you can use system reactive um, namespace to achieve the same thing, or you can have signal R in conjunction with Blazor. All of that is possible, but I just resorted to this way of doing it. Uh, there's one thing to bear in mind. Azure Web PubSub is a data processor service. There is no customer content being stored. So your content is safe. It's GDPR uh, al uh, aligned and everything else. And talking about my setup for the day, what I'm doing today is whenever a talk is published in Umbraco, using the uh, uh, notification handler, it sends a message to the Azure Web PubSub service. And my Maui app, being an equally connected client, keeps on getting the message from the Azure Web PubSub service using a WebSocket connection. So I'll explain the Umbraco code for this because the WebSocket aspect of it is inspired from a gist by Steve Sanderson. So in my Umbraco solution, I've got this custom notification where I'm handling the content published notification. So this notification is received every time a content is published. I'm injecting the web, web pub subservice client, which is available as a part of my NuGet package, and it connects to my Azure in uh, my web pub sub instance and it sends messages to something called a hub in Azure Web PubSub. But that's again, more information which you can gather from the docs, but just understand that there is a service called Azure Web, Sub, Web PubSub and Umbraco sends messages to that service in the cloud. So I have this handler handle method as a part of the interface. And for every published entities, I'm checking whether the content type is of type talk. And if it is of the type talk, I'm adding a message to the notification. This is the actual notification which shows up in the back end of Umbraco. So whenever um, a talk is published, this gets shown in the back office. 
And I'm also sending a message to all the connected clients to my Azure Web Pub sub instance. I'm sending a message called New Talk Published, and the entity of the the name of the entity is passed as well. So let's have a look. Um, let me bring up my Umbraco instance here and let me resize it. Uh, let me have my Windows as well as Maui app here. Go back to the talks. Uh, I need to go into a talk. So let's save and publish and see what happens. So I've got the notification in the back office, and I've also got some real-time information from my web pub sub service. This is real-time information within the app. This is not to be confused with the system notifications or the app notifications. Um, so that is uh, it from me around Maui and Umbraco 9. A big thank you to Gerald. Um, he helped me a lot with um, with some of the questions I had and provided me some very valuable feedback. He's got a YouTube channel. Feel free to go and have a look at it for a lot of Maui information. And thank you, Heng, for connecting me with Gerald. And that's my resources for the day, which I will put a link to in the channel. The resources are pretty thin at the moment because Maui is still in preview, but uh, it's at a place where you can actually start looking into and play around with. I hope you have learned a thing or two today. Finally, happy Christmas. Merry Christmas wherever, wherever you are. Stay safe. A very good new year to you all. And thank you once again. See you in 2022 or even before. Thank you very much, Purnima. Um, I think that was a very interesting talk about uh, Maui as well as the new APIs, uh, talking about the Umbraco mm -hmm. Mapper as well as the notifications and such. Thank you for that. I think it's very, uh, very important that people get to know these new APIs. Uh, the sooner, the yeah. better. Uh, there was actually a message uh, coming from Gerald uh, for you. Uh, he mentioned to you that the preview 11 was the latest one, but he also mentioned that the Visual Studio preview right now has issues with that version. So number version 10 is actually preferred currently, if you want to use yep. the yeah. preview version of Visual Studio. <laughs> it, it was supposed to be my next question to general at some point. How can I update my preview? <laughs> but luckily, because it was like two days away from my talk, I didn't want to update my preview. So I'm still using preview 10. Sorry, I didn't make it clear, but I am still using <laughs> preview 10. Uh, yes, so with every preview, there are things brought in. Um, so give it a day or two before you actually upgrade yourselves and then see what's going on. Yeah, all right. Um, I have w actually had one one question for you. I think your whole talk was very clear, so didn't really come. Any, uh, didn't re didn't nothing really didn't come up. I had some trouble forming that sentence. Um, how disappointed when you were you when you heard that Maui was moved to .NET six instead of .NET five? Because initially it was announced that it would be part of the .NET five that released in November. I think no, it was uh, no. It was supposed to be released. Last month, .NET yeah, 6. Yeah, exactly. It, uh, it, yeah, so it's got delayed, but I think uh, there is a very genuine case for that. Microsoft <laughs> wants it to be usable right from day one. That is the message that I get, and it comes across very strongly. So they are going to ship it when they are ready to do it, mm -hmm. uh, which I think is fair enough. And that's <laughs> the message I got from the keynote. So I'm happy to wait for it. Yeah. But there is the preview available for me to play around with, gain some knowledge, see what is possible. So I think it's all building up for me. <laughs> <laughs>